Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Oates. I was asked a few years ago by one of my, by one of my publishers um, if I could write another true crime book. So I said, well, I found a really interesting um, series of arsenic poisonings in Cornwall between, um, in the 1930s. And my publisher said, well, no one's heard of that, Jonathan. We want someone that people have heard of. So I thought, well, who's, who's a well-known criminal that hasn't been written about for some, some time? I thought, what about Dick Turpin? Someone who I didn't know that much about then. And, and he said, yes, that's, that's a good one. So without further ado, I'm, I'll be giving a talk about Dick Turpin in both um, um, fact and fiction. So... so this is the, is the DVD set of the five of the episodes of Dick Turpin on TV, which I purchased a few years ago for research purposes. Anyway, we'll get on to the real thing now, hopefully. Um, okay, so the birthplace of Dick Turpin. Dick Turpin was born on the 21st of September, 1705, in a pub called the Blue Bell Pub in Hempstead, which is in North Essex. It's as far north as you can get before you get into Cambridgeshire. Uh, it's a very small village, then as now, and on the pub, which I regret to say is now not, in all, in, 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 is not working, as it were, um, that's where he was born. There's a plaque, on, as I've just shown you, on the wall. If you're eagle-eyed, you can see the plaque on the pub. And it's, it's on the north side of the main road through the village. Now, Turpin's, he was the fifth of at least six children of John and Mary Turpin. John Turpin's father was a part-time innkeeper and he was also, by profession, a butcher. Turpin himself was baptised at St Andrew's Church, which is the parish church of Hempstead. It's on the other side of the road from the pub. It's literally just across the road. Um, and he was educated by... A man called James Smith, who will play, plays an important part in this story, um, in, the, in what's now the vestry room of the church, as you can see there. So Turpin learnt to read and write um, in about a year, um, age about 11 or 12. But for most of his youth, he was, he was learning the butcher's trade from his father, which is a very common thing to do. Um, and by the 1720s, he was working as a butcher elsewhere, probably well, um, in Thaxted. Thaxted is a small village in Essex, not very far from Hempstead, a few miles to the south. And if you go to Thaxted now, you can see, still see this street with its Tudorish building, and it's called Dick Turpin's Cottage. The person who lives there obviously likes Dick Turpin, because if you go past the window, uh, um, you can see figurines of Dick Turpin and others um, in the window. So. Um, so, so he may well have, have, have been working as a butcher in this place at the end of the 1720s and the beginning of the 1730s. It may also be around this time that, that, that he was married to someone called Elizabeth, who was described as a servant girl. And people in Hempstead remembered him later as, as selling meat, so it must have been quite close to Hempstead where he was selling his meat. However, for one reason or other, we do not know, he decided that being a butcher wasn't good enough. So he decided, or he was recruited, into a gang called the Gregory Gang. Now the Gregory Gang, or the Essex Gang, as it was sometimes named, was um, a group of deer stealers who, who stole deer from Epping Forest and other woods nearby. However, that became more dangerous because money started to be to be put as bounties on the heads of all these deer stealers. So they decided it, it would be safer, more profitable to start to become housebreakers. So Turpin joined um, Samuel Gregory, Jamie Gregory, Jasper Gregory, and another dozen desperados who broke into, who attacked people's houses, broke into them in the night times, um, attacked and tied up the householders and the servants stole their things, which included, as well as things like money and jewellery, they also stole items such as um, blankets or pots and pans, food, drink, all sorts of things. Um, and this was something that they did. Now, one of the most infamous attacks, and, and this is in 1734, was to attack a woman called Mrs. Anne Shelley, who lived in, in a small house with her son, in Loughton, so not far from here, and 
the, there's different versions of what happened. One version, as depicted here, we see Turpin and friends roasting Mrs. Shelley over the fire in order to get her to reveal where her money was. But another version says they only threatened her. So obviously that's not quite as bad, is it? Um, but it's still not good. However, um, the son of, of, of Mrs. Shelley was very concerned, was more concerned than Mrs. Shelley was about her physical health and, and said, please, Mother, tell them where the money is. So she did, and she was left unroasted. Um, and um, that was one of their many crimes. They also attacked um, the, the rectory at Great Pandon. They attacked lots of other houses in this area, um, mainly in the Essex district, which is where, is where the gang mainly operated from. Sometimes they would attack lonely farmsteads and households south of London as well, but it was mainly to the north of London and the northeast of London. In 1735, the gang became more daring. They attacked um, farms in um, in Edgware, and, one of them, and that was one of, one of another another of their very terrible attacks. Because they, apart from beating up the old farmer, farmer Joseph Lawrence, who was 73, they basically poured boiling water over him. They threatened to cut his throat. They beat him on his on his bottom. They also threatened to, to put him in the fireplace. Um, they also um, Samuel Gregory. He 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 physically assaulted the maid servant Dorothy Street as well, and as well as stealing money from the house. And only two days later, the gang were making attack at a farmstead fairly nearby as well. So um, they were obviously becoming very bold and very unafraid of of what anyone might do to them. Unfortunately for them, a couple of days later, some of them were in a pub in London and they were spotted by one of the servants belonging to Farmer Lawrence's household. He informed the constable, they got some men together and arrested some of the gang. One of the gang members, John Wheeler, he was only 15 years old and he may have been a reluctant gang member. And certainly when he was given the choice of um, or possibly being hanged for um, house breaking and assault, which is obviously a capital offence then, um, or been given a reward if, if he described with other gang members where to find them, what they looked like, and so on. He thought the second option sounded better. So he went for that, and some more of the gang members were arrested. So by the end of February 1735, just a few, a few weeks after some of their most um, vicious um, attacks. Half the gang were in prison and um, about to be tried at the Old Bailey. Um, now this is a brief list of the gang members and what happened to them. As you can see from a, a fairly quick glance, I hope, many of them were executed. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six were executed. Um, several were transported to the American colonies for seven years. Um, a couple of them died in prison, three of them died in prison. So most of the gang were eventually rounded up. But you will notice one name is missing from there. It's not only John Wheeler, it's also Richard Turpin. He's missing. But Turpin was very good at surviving. He managed to escape where most of the gang members were rounded up. Um, just to, to let you know what happened to the gang members, um, if you ever go near, um, if you ever, um, in, in London, you might see, see this plaque, the site of Tyburn Tree. Um, and also, we, at this time, the first time we have a description of what Turpin looked like. Very much marked with smallpox, about five feet nine inches high. A butcher, about 26 years of age, wears a blue grey coat and a light natural wig. As you can see from this, from this description, he's far from being the handsome hero of fiction. He's marked with smallpox. Um, the age is slightly wrong. He, he, was, he was actually slightly, he, he was actually about, about 30 rather than 26. But otherwise, that's the first, first actual description of him. But he manages to escape where most of the gang members are um, rounded up, tried, uh, hanged, transported, etc. 
one of the other gang members briefly joins Turpin, um, a man called Thomas Rowden. And Thomas Rowden and Turpin decide, with only two of them, it's going to be difficult robbing houses when it could be several people they need to immobilise. It would be better and, and easier and safer if we robbed people on the roads leading up to London. Now, at this time, as now, London is the largest city in, 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 in Britain. It's where lots of wealthy people live. Um, lots of people are coming and going from London because of improvements of, of road transport. But policing around the capital is fairly limited, to say the least. So the roads around London are easy pickings and good pickings, as it were, for thieves. Um, many travellers are travelling by themselves, sometimes on foot, sometimes on horseback and two men can easily rob them and get away with it. So that's what they start to do. After a while, Rowden decides enough is enough, he wants to go back to what he's good at, which is counterfeiting money. Uh, he ends up actually in prison and then being transported. Um, but Turpin, he is into robbing people um, on, the, um, on the roads around London. Now, there's still a reward for him. Queen Caroline, who is the wife of George II, she issues a reward of £50 for Turpin, dead or alive. £50 is more than an annual income for many people, so it is serious money. Now, Turpin goes back to Epping, where, of course, the housebreaking took place earlier on. Um, and this is in, mid, in the middle of 1735. He teams up with a man called Matthew King. And this is Matthew King as a pot figure. You'll note he's called Tom King, but his real name was Matthew King. He became known as Tom King in the 19th century. Anyway, he's a young man. He's a few years younger than Turpin. And he and Turpin take to robbing people on the Great North Road, which runs through Essex um, into London. Um, you get travellers travelling between Cambridge and London uh, and, and, and many others. Um, they seem to make quite a, a good bit of money at this. Turpin emerges as a more vicious of the two. He's happy to rob anyone. Whereas, whereas, whereas Mr. King, uh, on one occasion, he sees um, two young women bringing back some goods from the market. So he doesn't think that you ought to rob them. But Turpin says, why not? I think we ought to. Um, however, on one occasion, in 1737, they steal a traveler's horse and take the horse into Whitechapel to sell. Now, the man who, who the horse is stolen from was a man called Mr. Major, and he asks a pub landlord of a pub in Epping Forest called Richard Bays of Green, um, Green Man Pub, what should he do? Richard Bays says, well, the best thing to do if you want your horse back is to offer a reward, and I can go into London and distribute some posters for you. So he does. To cut a long story short, um, Richard Bays is in... Whitechapel, and he discovers in the Red Lion pub, in the stables of the Red Lion pub in Whitechapel, the horse that he's looking for. And he finds some constables and some other men, and they lay an ambush for Turpin and, and Matthew King. There's a fight, and someone, someone fires a gun, possibly more than one gun. It's, and Matthew King lies dying. It's not certain who fired, who fired the shot. Some newspaper reports say it's Richard Bays who fired it by mistake, trying to hit Turpin. Some people say it was Turpin. Richard Bays, of course, in his account in 1739, he said it was Dick Turpin. But some of the um, newspapers that first came out shortly after this say it's Richard Bays. But whoever it was, Matthew King uh, dies, is 25, um, in Newgate Prison, and he's buried at St. James's Church in Islington. Meanwhile, Turpin escapes and he goes into Epping Forest, where there's a, now a reward of £100 on his head. A man called Thomas Morris, who's, who's um, a serving man, he, he tries to claim this money. He takes a gun with him, he goes into Epping Forest to try and hunt down Turpin. But Turpin hunts him down and shoots him dead. So, so this is the first definite murder Turpin has committed. He may have committed the early one, um, on Matthew King as well. But he's killed at least one man, possibly two men. The reward for him goes, goes up now up to £200. So very serious money indeed. Turpin realises that people, are, that more people are going to try and claim money. So if he stays around London, um, 
he's in great danger of his life. So he decides to disappear. No one knows he has disappeared, and in the next couple of years, there's still stories in the newspapers about a highwayman called Turpin who is robbing people around London. But some newspapers say, oh, perhaps he's gone to Holland or Scotland or France or Spain or, 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 or somewhere else. Um, but around about this time, this is in June 1737, um, a man called John Palmer appears in the small Yorkshire village of Bruff, which is in the east riding of Yorkshire, quite close to Hull, and also quite close to his place, Welton as well. Um, and he, he describes himself as a dealer in, um, in horses, and he often buys horses, or so he says, um, from Lincolnshire, he brings them to Yorkshire, sells them at a profit, and seems to be quite popular. He will buy his horses, and they're all good horses, and they're all, all, all um, very, um, very, very well priced, and um, he becomes quite popular. He even joins some of local gentry um, in hunting expeditions. And um, on the 2nd of October 1738, he's been out hunting, but hasn't caught anything. So, he, so, so Mr. Palmer is not a happy man. He's walking up Bruff High Street and uh, he sees um, a cockerel. He's, for some reason, he takes out his anger on the cockerel and fires his pistol at it and shoots it and kills it. Um, and the man walking past said, that cockerel, did you know, it belongs to your landlord, Mr. Morris. Um, and, he says, and he says, well, um, unless you want to be shot, get out of the way. So a man does. And... Mr. Palmer goes back to the place he's living at, which is the Green Dragon Pub in Welton. The Green Dragon Pub is on the far right-hand corner of the picture. Later that evening, um, a magistrate and a constable come round, arrest Mr. Palmer for, for this fairly minor offence of killing a hen. And next day, he's, taught, he's before the magistrates at Beverley, the county town of East Riding, in the, in the courthouse. He's um, charged with, with a minor crime of shooting dead a cockerel, and he is, and um, now he might get bail, because it's fairly minor, but for some reason he doesn't seem to have any money to pay, or, or any friends who, who, can, who can give money for the payment of, of bail. So um, he, he could apologise, but he doesn't do any of these things. So he, he's put in custody, and the magistrates decide to find out more about him, about this, this horse dealer from Lincolnshire. They discover from Lincolnshire magistrates that this man, Palmer, if that is his real name, is actually a horse thief. And um, so, well, horse thieving is a capital offence. Um, so he's taken from Beverly to the purpose-built York Prison, um, and, um, which was built in, in 1705. He's put here, and he is, he's told he'll, he'll stand trial for horse theft, a capital offence, at the York Assizes in March 1739. Now, whilst he's in prison, Palmer does a bit of thinking. He realises now, finally, he is in serious danger. So he writes to his brother-in-law, and uh, he asks if he can have, if he can help him. But the letter to his brother-in-law, um, in those days, you had to pay to receive your mail. Now, his brother-in-law does not want to pay the money, a few pence, to, 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 to open his brother-in-law's letter. Perhaps he realises who is writing to him. And by chance, a man called James Smith, who I mentioned earlier on, who taught the young Richard Turpin how to read and write, he recognises the handwriting. He asks the magistrate if he can open the letter, so an open letter, and he says, I think I know who this man is. This man, Palmer, is actually Richard Turpin, the notorious um, thief and murderer. Smith goes up to York Prison. There's some sort of identity parade. He spots him, and now... This is becoming not just a local matter, but a national matter, because Turpin is seen by the government as a major criminal, which, of course, he is. Duke of Newcastle is the Secretary of State for the North, um, leading politician, and he has correspondence with the Attorney General, Sir Dudley Ryder. And basically, Newcastle says that, um, I know he's going to be tried at York, horse theft. If he's found not guilty, he hasn't to be let go. We've got to take him down to London and try him for other crimes, um, because this is a very serious matter. 
The newspapers get hold of this story, and there's lots of discussion as to whether this man is actually Turpin, who as everyone has read about a few years ago in the newspapers as a highwayman, the murderer, and the thief, or is it the horse thief? And people are, um, are laying odds as, as to who he actually is. Anyway, um, he's put on trial um, on the 22nd of March, 1739. The trial lasts about an hour. There's witnesses from his Essex village, Hempstead, including James Smith and others. There's also people whose horses he stole because it's, it's, a, it's a trial for horse theft, not for highwaymen men or for murder. The judge is Sir William Chappell, um, who hopefully will appear soon. Um, yeah. Uh, and after an hour, Turpin is found to be guilty and sentenced to death. Now, some, pr some prisoners might spend the last few um, weeks um, or hours of their life um, in, um, in penitence um, in a prison cell. But Turpin isn't one of those number. Turpin is what we will now call a celebrity criminal. People come in, people pay to come in and see him, and they give him presents of fine clothing, fine food, drink. So for the last three weeks of his life, it, it's a party. People want to be, want to talk to him, and, and, and want to hear his stories. And I'm sure he's a very good storyteller. Um, but this is the cell. If you ever go up to York Prison, um, which is part of York Castle Museum, highly recommended. Um, this is the cell that they think he was in, um, and which may or may not be the case. Anyway, um, he is taken out on the 7th of April, 1739, to um, Tyburn. Now, this is Tyburn in York, not Tyburn in London. Tyburn is actually about a mile south of York Centre. In, it's very near to the race course at Knavesmire. It is alleged by York Castle Museum staff that this whistle belonged to Turpin and he gave it to either the chaplain or the executioner. The irony is that the executioner was himself a highwayman. Um, and um, in those days, there was no official paid state executioner as there was in the 20th century. Um, what they would do, they would ask a prisoner um, who was condemned if he wanted a reprieve, if he did, he could act as executioner. So um, the highwayman executed, executioner, he executed not only Turpin, but also John Stead, who was um, another horse thief. Um, and that was on, on, on the, the afternoon of the 7th of April, 1739. That's where Tyburn is, um, it's marked. And there's also a display board. York really does go to town about Dick Turpin. There's lots of stuff about Turpin related in York, which is um, very interesting. Um, this is a plaque that tells you about Turpin and also other criminals and other people who've been hanged, hanged there. Um, interestingly enough, Turpin, um, after he was hanged, he was taken back to York and he was take, he, it's alleged he's, uh, his corpse was laid out in this room, in the Blue Ball pub, which has a Turpin room, which is there. I have been there at least three times for research purposes. Uh, <laughs> any Turpin historian needs to go to a lot of pubs for um, research. Um, anyway, um, and he was laid out here, and allegedly, and I can believe this is true, um, the landlord made money by, by charging people, people t to see the corpse of Turpin. But, he, but his corpse did not rest there very long because it obviously was buried. But even it was, when it was buried, um, Dr. Marmaduke Palms, who was a city surgeon, he paid men to take the body so he could experiment on it for medical purposes. And this caused a brawl between some people who might not have liked Dick Turpin as a highwayman or as, as, as a criminal, but they didn't think, think the, the dead ought to be disturbed. So there's a brawl and various people were um, 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 tried by the magistrates and uh, promised that they would be they would behave well if you do go to york there's a small cemetery near york castle museum and um you can see the gravestone of dick turpin which i will show you later on now the next slide shouldn't really be here because um but it is but anyway um we'll have a look at it because william harrison ainsworth was a popular novelist of the, of the 19th century um for a time he was even a bit a better seller than his friend Charles Dickens, almost unknown now. 
and he was, he was from Manchester. But his claim to fame here is that he wrote a book called Rookwood. And Rookwood introduces us in the 19th century, this is in, in the 1830s, um, to the idea that Richard Turpin was actually Dick Turpin. He rode a horse called Black Bess. Uh, he was a gallant highwayman, a great hero. Now, all this was, wasn't actually William Harrison Ainsworth's um, original fantasy, because there had been plays and books about Richard Turpin since 1800, which had the ride to York and other elements of the York myth. But um, Ainsworth, he put all these ingredients together in this book. Uh, it became a bestseller, it went un underwent lots of editions, and many other authors wrote similar books. There were many comic books as well, and, and um, Dick Turpin became, a, as, as, he was now because, as he was now known, um, he, was, he, he was very popular among children, and some people at the time, um, schoolmasters, clergymen, and others, were very concerned that um, children would read, impressionable children, would read the Xbox of Dick Turpin and think that crime was a good thing. And they were very concerned also that Dick Turpin became more interesting to, to the average school child than, than, than real life historical figures like Queen Victoria of Duke of Wellington or Napoleon. And, and, and it's almost similar to what people in later years have, have, have described as, uh, um, say, um, a video nasty or, or other corrupting influences on the impressionable youth. Um, but anyway, Dick Turpin comics were very popular, and um, in the 20th century, we have films. Um, this is a very early Dick Turpin lookalike, an American version, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are a number of Turpin films. One of the first one was this one in 1922, a silent film. And then Victor McLaughlin became the first talking Turpin in 1933. Neither of these films still exist. Um, however, one film which certainly does exist is this one. Now, I had not seen this film until a couple of years ago. Um, and I watched it uh, when I was writing this book. Um, and it's ironic because I live quite close to Pinewood Studios. This pub is actually only about a mile or two from where I live. And, of course, it's the last carry-on film that Sid James was in, the last one that Barbara Windsor was in. Uh, and it's, I think it's the last one that Joan Sims was in as well. So it is a bit of an end of an era film. Turpin in this film is an elderly vicar, masquerade, but really is a highwayman as well. So it's not quite the same as reality. Um, and as the carry on film says, it may not be historical, but it is hysterical. <laughs> Um, another part of the legend, of course, I've mentioned Richard O'Sullivan's The Adventures of Dick Turpin already. Um, in that story, there is a place called Rookham Hall, which may be based from the, from the book Rookwood, possibly. Rookham Hall is where Sir John Glutton, who's Turpin's arch enemy, lives, who's an evil, evil squire. Um, and Rookham Hall also duplicates as the stately home to lots of other villains in the same series. And presumably the um, series had a low budget and they thought, well, the average viewer isn't going to realise that this house appears to be the home of lots of different people. But um, that's a way of introducing people to the story. Um, now, now, it's also serious history as well. Um, Derek Barler wrote, in my opinion, one of the best books on the topic. It's a very heavyweight book in all senses of that meaning. It's, it's written by an archivist and a historian for, I would suggest, archivists and historians. It's very dense, it has lots of information in, it's hard to see wood from the trees, but if you're a serious scholar, it's interesting and good. If you're not, it's probably worth a miss, but you should read, however, the Dick Turpin, The Myth of the English Highwayman by James Sharp, Professor of History. This is as much about highwaymen, law and order, crime in the 18th century, and how it's been reinterpreted in the 19th and 20th centuries. It has a bit about Dick Turpin in it. He's not the main focus of the book, although there is a lot about him, and it is good, um, and it's very well written, so I would strongly advise this book uh, as well. Now, um, I've got to stop in a couple of minutes, so I shall just say a little bit more. Um, but horrible histories. A, a couple of years ago, I was working with um, 
um, a student volunteer in the archives that I work at, and I mentioned to her, I was writing this book about Dick Turpin, and she said, I love Dick Turpin. And I said, you can't love Dick Turpin, he's a terrible man. And I explained all the reasons why. And then she said, oh, no, 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 I like the song, the, the um, Horrible History song. And I said, well, the Horrible History song is actually quite good. Um, it's actually reasonably accurate. Um, not entirely, sir, but it's not too bad. It's in the right direction. Um, interesting that the Dick Turpin for children is allowed to shoot dead two men, that, that's fine, but he cannot shoot a cockerel. He can try and steal one, but killing a little innocent bird is too hardcore. Um, talking about hardcore Turpin, um, there's, um, there's a, a two-part trilogy um, called The Myth of the, about the English Highwayman. The Highwayman in question is Turpin. It's a low-budget um, series of two DVDs. I think it cost them £250,000 to make each one. So we're talking serious money in 2020. Um, it's it's certificate 18. It's a bit more like the real Turpin. He's a very vicious, horrible folk, and there's violence, and there's um, terrible language, there's um, lots of other, other things which would never appear in any of the earlier films. Turpin in this is not a good guy. It's more like the historical Turpin. It's unfortunate that the Gregory gang is two men and a woman rather than about 12 men and a woman, but I suppose it, they had restrictions on their budgets. I've been asked to read a little bit of the famous poem, The Highwayman, by Alfred Knowles. The last verse. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard. He taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Now, Alfred Norris also wrote a poem for Dick Turpin as well. Um, this poem is about a more anonymous highwayman. Um, the Turpin poem is less well known, but this one is still on the school curriculum. Now, um, just for final part about Dick Turpin, and then we'll have questions. So the tourist industry in York, as I've already said, makes a lot about Dick Turpin. There's a pub, the Blue Ball Pub, which has the Turpin Rooms, um, in which I met Professor James Sharp, who I mentioned, who wrote the book earlier on. So um, that was good. And um, the York Dungeon also advertises in, in, in a bit like London Dungeon, but with York themed people. Um, it has Turpin in. And a recent story, which was came too late for my book, um, apparently last year, some parents um, said that the term Dick Turpin couldn't be used because it, it's a rude word and, they, and their children might get concerned and frightened by this four-letter word beginning with D. So um, a local MP said this is political correctness gone mad and, um, and, and so I, I emailed the MP and I said well um, obviously um, um, it, it's worth noting that his, his name was actually Richard, not Dick. I said, so the parents, although they, they, they're saying it for the wrong reason, aren't entirely incorrect in saying that Dick was not actually his name. But um, I said, because he's been called Dick Turpin for the last two centuries, I think we're stuck with that name. <laughs> and, he, and the MP said, that's very interesting. Uh, York Dungeon again. And there's also, in York on that day, I saw an advert for a Dick Turpin pantomime. There are several Dick Turpin pantomimes in which Dick Turpin, of course, is the good guy. He's the heroic hero. And the force of law and order are the bad guys. Um, okay, if you go to York Castle Museum, you will see the chains allegedly worn by Dick Turpin when he was in prison. And if also, if you go further to York, you'll see the Red Lion Pub, which claims, because it says so on a big plaque outside, that Dick Turpin used to drink here and he escaped the forces of law and order um, um, in his pub. But of course, Turpin never went to York except as a prisoner under lock and key. He was never, he never had the good fortune as we can to go up to York uh, and have a pint of beer if, if we wish. Um, the, in the 20th century, this gravestone was put up um, it says, um, John Palmer, otherwise Richard Turpin, the notorious highwayman and horse dealer, executed at, high, at 
Tyburn, April the 7th, 1739, and buried in St. George's churchyard. Now, we don't know actually if he probably isn't actually buried under there. He's probably more likely to be buried near the entrance to the graveyard. There's also a plaque and an information board about Dick Turpin um, in the churchyard as well. So that's obviously good to see. But closer to home, we have Dick Turpin's cottage in Thackstead, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, and in fact, if you go to Thackstead, you'll see it proudly announced on the door. You'll also see if you go to Hempstead where he was but he was born and baptized there's also a Dick Turpin's cottage there as well now think of how many notorious criminals um, 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 have got their names displayed over houses probably not very many uh, a Turpin is one of them I should also mention that there is a new book that people may 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 wish to purchase at some stage um, Dick Turpin fact and fiction and finally um, I mentioned earlier about Dick Turpin in pubs. Uh, lots of pubs like to claim they have, they have a link with Turpin. And when I did, a, I did this same talk for Ealing, because I'm the archivist Ealing, I give this talk and I discovered three pubs in Ealing that Turpin is alleged to, to have, have involved with. But of course, these are all spurious. The first one is the Plough, which is in South Ealing. I went here a few years ago um, with a, a student, and um, I said to the barman, was there any Turpin connections in this pub that he knew of? Because I already knew that there was. Uh, and he so I said, I didn't know anything about Dick Turpin and this pub until today. We have a second person to have asked me on this, this day. So that was a rather odd. Um, there's also an alleged link with the Georgian Dragon Pub in Acton, but uh, again, it's uh, completely spurious because the only time Turpin was was um, was thieving to the west of London was in Fulham. Um, he had no connection with Hounslow Heath, by the way. Um, other highwaymen like Claude Duval did, but not him. And finally, another pub in West Ealing, the Old Hats, also claimed to have Turpin links as well, but entirely spurious. There's lots of other pubs around London, such as uh, the Spaniards in Hampstead Heath, uh, and, 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 uh, and there's one in Highgate, and there's lots of others, uh, the Ostrich in Cornbrook in Buckinghamshire, lots of others, uh, all, all, all fake. Um, the White Horse pub where Turpin and his friends rode to go on their, on their attack on, the, on Mr. Lawrence's farm in February 1735 is a genuine pub, but they, have, they make no mention of Turpin there at all. Um, so just a few things to, to wrap up. Um, one thing that I must if say, if, if, you, if you learn nothing from tonight, you must know that the ride to York is completely fictional. It was invented in, 18, in 1800. The myth is, in case you don't know it, is that Turpin rode on his horse Black Bess. Um, in, um, um, on one night, he rode from one, one horse from London to York, which is about 200 miles. Now, a friend of mine who's, who's a horsewoman says that's absolutely impossible. You could do 50 miles on, on a good day if a horse was trained for endurance um, training. Most horses aren't. Uh, but 50 miles would be a maximum. So it cannot be done on one horse in one day. Um, however, um, the other thing about that is that, is that although that this is an, it's a myth dating from 1800, there were oh, there are myths about two other highwaymen. One, Richard Dudley, or Swift Nix, in, in 1670 odd, um, he allegedly made the first ride from London to York. And then someone called John Nevison, another highwayman, hanged in York in the 17th century, he allegedly made the ride from London to York as well. So there's lots of highwaymen who, who, who it is alleged, but impossible, of course, that, that they did this. Um, Turpin is only one of three who allegedly made this epic but fake ride. That's one thing. Um, the other thing, more generally, I suppose, is that Turpin is really two men. He's the um, vicious, ugly thug, um, housebreaker, cattle thief, maybe deer stealer, highwayman, murderer, and killer of, um, of hens um, in, the, in the 1730s, a fairly despicable character. And then there's a 19th century Turpin where he's a gallant, handsome hero. In 19th century, of course, highwaymen were a thing of the past, a bit like pirates. You, um, you can safely make stories about them, you can have them as heroes and romantic figures, um, whereas in reality they were not like that. But um, that's, that's, that's one thing. And the other thing to bear in mind is that um, most of us know 
a little about lots of historical figures, but we usually know, only know a very little bit about them. Um, and, and, and whereas the real historical figure is often rather more complex than a black and white figure of good or bad. As we are in Chingford, I should mention two things about Chingford history and Dick Turpin, which are true. The first one is that John Gladwin of Chingford, he was a higgler or a peddler, not a, not a wealthy man at all. His house was broken into by the Gregory gang, including Turpin, in 1734, and they robbed him and a friend of his of goods to the value of seven pounds, nine pence. But a year later, Gladwin and some of his friends managed to capture Jeremiah Gregory, one of the leaders of the Gregory gang, and he was, and, and he was, and Gregory was later hanged at, at Chelmsford. And John Gladwin and his friends got reward money for um, capturing um, Gregory. So that's one genuine link with Chingford. The other, perhaps more interesting link, is that in August 1737, the newspapers reported that a son had been born in a house near Chingford um, by Turpin's wife. And this was John, John Turpin, Turpin's only son that we know of. Um, so that's another Chingford link. Um, Interestingly enough, when Turpin, just before Turpin was hanged, um, he left what little he had, which included um, a couple of rings and some wooden clogs, to a woman in, um, in Yorkshire, not his wife, of course. Um, who that woman is, we, we will never know, but it is an interesting uh, comment. So that is the end of my very brief talk about Dick Turpin in fact and fiction. There's a lot more that we can talk about. I'm happy to try and answer any questions if anyone has any questions or any comments or any anecdotes or stories that they might have about the reality or more likely the fiction that surrounds Turpin. Thank you. Dr Jonathan Oates, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating. I'm sure there must be some questions about this subject. There is. I'll just go to the chap at the back. Bear with me. I've got to bring my microphone around so everyone can hear. Bear with me, please. At Wall Park, which is not far up the road here, there is eight. Any comments? Well, <laughs> I think it's. Um part of the myth, I imagine, um, but it, and I'm afraid it's a new one on me. I have come across lots of myths, but I haven't, I haven't come across that one. Um, it'd be interesting to know a little bit more about it um, before I can, I, I wouldn't like to say it's definitely a myth. It probably is, but not necessarily, because obviously Turbin is associated with uh, Loughton, Chingford, Buckhurst Hill, etc. So there may possibly be a real connection, but it's something that would need more investigation. Okay. Now. Yeah, a brilliant talk, uh, Dr. Oates. Uh, my question is to do with the forces of law and order. Now, about, this was about Dick Turpin's life, obviously is the most wanted highwayman in England with a price on his head of a hundred pounds. Um, you know, he was hunted for by the forces of uh, London and where he mainly um, these robberies. Who were the forces of law and order, considering that this was about 100 years before Sir Robert Peel had invented the police force, you know, in the form of the Bow Street Runners? Yeah, well, basically, um, you've got magistrates of justice of the peace and the main law officers as such, but they're not directly involved in catching criminals. You've got the parish constables, um, but again, I, I mentioned one constable who was Constable Pullen, and he was involved in arresting some of the criminals in Westminster in 1735, um, but with the help of ordinary citizens. A lot of law and order, to be quite honest, at that time was, was the ordinary citizen acting for money in order to arrest these people. Um, it's before the Burr Street Runners. I mean, often in the myth, um, people say, oh yeah, it was, it was the Burr Street Runners or the army who chased Dick Turpin, but, but neither um, are true. It was mainly the, the ordinary citizen who was activated, partly in some cases because he or his family or his friends or whoever had been robbed by criminals or people who wanted, actually, who wanted money. Uh, and, and it was, on the whole, quite an effective system, um, even though there wasn't a regular police. 
Any other questions? Yes, at the back there, one here. I'll just take this one here first, if I may. As children, we were always told that he had a hideaway at the top of Wellington Hill somewhere, Dick Turpin's cave. Is that part of the myth as well? Well, no, it was, Stroke is a Dick Turpin's cave in Epping Forest, um, which, which is alleged where he and Matthew King used as near hideout in 1737. Um, I don't know, I, um, certainly in the newspapers in the 19th century, it, it was spoken of, of as if it was true, and there was um, a cafe or restaurant nearby which had relics and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that's the same one that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, um, but it was certainly a part of the 19th century Turpin tourist industry, just as, as, it, as it would be for York in the 20th and 21st centuries. That was your question as well, okay. Anyone else got a question for Dr. Jonathan? Point with me. Oh, uh, yeah, there was a pub there called uh, the Dick Turpin Pub, and the cave was right by the side. Mm. And the uh, landlord, Riley, who is an ex keeper, uh, dined out on the story of Turpin in there for ages. He had relics in there also. Uh, and there's quite a few. Uh, I think it's the lithographs they did in them days mm. of him. Also, um, he was a near neighbour of Gary's in Suistonbury. He, um, he had his own slaughterhouse in Su Suiston, and in your book, I think you call it Susan. You mentioned it a couple of times. Yes, I Susan. think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was actually Suiston. Uh, okay, well, I, I was, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I just thought I'd throw that one in. Yeah, okay, well, and, well, and well it, it's good to hear you. Thanks, yeah. And he took the hides from Suiston, yeah. which I think was by Fred Venable's pub, the Royal Oak, yeah. up to the Abbey, to the Tanners, and that's where he got uh, first went on the run yeah. when they found the hides in there. Yeah. And I just wanted to pick you up on a couple of things you've said. Okay, okay. Well. <laughs> Peter, I'm just a bit closer. Yeah. You don't, you don't be, it's a pretty good talk. Thank you. But, oh. um, but I, bought, I bought your book, and, and the first pages of your book, you're saying that you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to set out to demonise anyone or demonise their character. It's just going to be fact. And you're not going to use no hype. And then you go on to say, in the very next page, you called Turpin a murderer. Well, he did kill, he did kill one or two people illegally. Well, it is true. Well, I'd just like to say, if me and Gary came at you now with a loaded gun, cocked, and we'd just been to a pub and borrowed them loaded guns and told them that we were going to go and shoot you with them, and you had a gun there, and we came at you, would you call that murder if you picked up your gun and shot first, or self-defence? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, obviously, we, obviously the, the exact circumstances of a shooting well, are, are not known. Well, well, you've really gone into the story, but, um, and, and you ought to know what self-defence, there's no one in their right mind would convict anyone nowadays of shooting in self-defence if two guys, uh, spawn affidavits, they said that they went to a pub, picked up these guns, loaded them, primed them, charged them, and went off them. And when Turpin said, uh, I've lost me, I'm looking for a horse. And, he, and they said, we're not worried about a horse, we're looking for, I'll grab me Turpin. And they pulled their gun back. That's when he grabbed his gun and shot him. And I would call that self-defense in anyone's money. Well, uh, well that's uh, part well, of you, yeah. Hang on, there's another one. Yeah, OK. The first one, what he was uh, on the run for, to start with, he was there again, they were just going to pick up a horse they'd stolen. Now, horse stealing is, is, was the same in them days, you could say, as joyriding, kids now nicking cars uh, and joyriding in them. And they might get two or three hours community service or a fine or something like that. Some of them even get a reward nowadays. But in them days, they could get hung for it. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the horse was the car. Yeah. And they would get hung for it. And that was harsh enough. And all they'd done was taken that horse and buys. You haven't said much about his character, but Bayes was known as a bit of a dodgy character itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it was Bayes who shot Matthew King, well, according, according to your own 
uh, people who you've quoted. Well, actually, I think I give two different accounts. Actually, it's not certain who did the shooting. It could have been oh, theirs. I saw could have been. One, I'll go to June to saying that. Yeah. It's not certain who shot him. No, I, I do so, say that. Yeah. So, and, and we do know also that the Duke of, uh, what is it? Newcastle. Newcastle. He went to the Attorney General and asked for his advice. The Attorney General said all we can do him for is horse stealing. Yeah. We, nothing else. No, no. He was never charged, in, he was never convicted of any murder. No, 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 although indeed. Although we could admit that he might have killed someone, but I say that was in self defence. And there's an old neighbour of someone in Chingford talking to someone who's come from Ealing. Someone's got to protect him. Someone from Chingford has got to speak up for the guy and he's never murdered anyone in his life. Well, OK, you're a good defence advocate. But the reason why he wasn't charged with murder was because it was easy to get him for horse theft because there were, all, there were a lot more witnesses. And it was, it was easy to convict him for that. And it's a capital offence anyway. So. But he did murder a cockerel, though, didn't he? <laughs> okay. Any well, other questions? That's, oh. petty, that's a minor thing. Hi. Is it possible that it wasn't Dick, the Dick Turpin that was caught in York? It's Did pretty certain it was. It, um, I, I think you're thinking of, in, in, or you might be, in the Adventures of Dick Turpin, the TV series, it says at the beginning of that, the real Dick Turpin, who's the good guy, he says that it was someone who was pretending to, to be me uh, he was hanged in York, but of course, in real life, um, a man in prison, um, he was pretending to be not Turpin, because that's who he was, but he was pretending to be John Palmer, uh, and he was identified by James Smith uh, through, through handwriting and facial recognition. So I think it's fairly safe to say it was him. I mean, I'm and surprised he wasn't caught earlier, actually. We've got some uh, comments from people online. Um, Alan's asking, are there any living descendants of Turpin? They may well be. I mean, as I said, he did have a son, John, who was born in 1737. And I had been shown a family tree earlier on today, uh, which I haven't actually read yet. But it is quite possible. I, I, I would imagine it's quite possible, yeah. Um, another question, is he linked to the Green Man, Green Man pub in Leytonstone? Well, if that's the same one that Richard Bayes had, um, in Epping Forest, so there is a connection in that Richard Bayes was the first man to write a, a book of, of sorts about Turpin in 1739. Um, he did indeed, yeah. yeah. I've just got one comment as well, um, which might be of interest to some people. Coming soon on Apple TV, the completely made up adventures of Dick Turpin, <laughs> a historical comedy television series starring Noel F Fielding. Hmm. Yeah, I think I mentioned that in, in, in the book. It was been talked about in 2022 as something that was coming up. Uh, and, and I thought, well, it may or may not happen. I'm going to have to say it has. Okay, Jonathan's got to leave very soon because he lives in Buckinghamshire. What, any, one last question, anyone? No, we're done. What a fascinating talk. Did you all enjoy that? Oh, Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>